Hello and welcome to the fourth edition of the Art Museum of West Virginia University's Museum from Home series. My name is Heather Harris and I'm the museum's educational programs manager and your guide to our works of art while we can't be together in the galleries. But I am not the only one working hard to bring you this content. I would like to give a shout out to museum preparator Michael Loop who has been safely checking on the galleries over the past few weeks and sending me the images that I need to produce these videos. This is even more important for today's installment because the piece we are featuring is difficult to capture in a photograph, but Mike did a great job. So thank you to him. And now let's take a look at one of his photos. Here, you can see the full scope of Jacob Hashimoto's Plumes 4. It reaches nearly from the top of the gallery wall to the floor. And even at that scale, it is a relatively small piece for Hashimoto who is known for enormous site-specific installations he calls clouds. But one thing our piece has in common with the rest of Hashimoto's work is the component parts, scores of delicate kites made of paper and wood. He uses the kites almost the way that pixels are used in digital images, taking lots of smaller pieces to create a cohesive whole. In the case of Plumes 4, the composition is relatively simple. Several layers of dark colored strings contrasted with the circular kites that cascade from them. What is the effect of this choice? What associations does it evoke? The title plumes could conjure a wisp of smoke or feather or the rush of a waterfall. But there is something more linear about this piece than any of those things. When I have spent time with the piece in person, I think of the strings on a guitar or a violin or the lines on a musical staff. Each kite a note of music. I then like to imagine what music this piece would play. What do you think? Something ethereal and delicate or loud and harsh? I'll let you decide. But now we're going to go back to that thing that I told you before about Hashimoto calling these pieces kites. One of the reasons I chose this piece for this week is that we are in prime kite season. The spring breezes are perfect for flying a kite and it's a nice solitary or family activity for the time. For Hashimoto, the kite also has additional significance. They are what he calls pan-cultural or universal objects. Kites have been used for thousands of years all over the world. In ancient China, they were used for military purposes, the length of the string allowing commanders to measure distances in enemy territory. They have been used for scientific experiments, to transport people, and for sports. But as spring starts to arrive, I like to think of their associations with childlike fun and delight. So for our activity today, I'm going to show you a few ideas for how you can make some kites at home. If you are feeling ambitious, you can try to make the first one fly, although I make no promises regarding aerodynamics. Or you can simply try one of the craft kite examples to bring some color to your home, and if you put them in your window, perhaps bring some joy to people as they are out on their daily walks. So to start, you need to find two thin sticks, one slightly shorter than the other. Once you have your sticks, an adult will need to carve a small notch in the end of each of them. So I am using a kitchen knife, but a pocket knife would probably work better. Next, you'll place the center of the small stick slightly higher than the center of the large stick and wrap the string around several times until it's secure. Then tie it and cut it off. Your next step is to insert the thread into the four notches you made at the end of the sticks. So just wrap it until you make it all the way around. And then again, cut it and tie it off. Now you have the frame of your kite. Then you can take a sheet of newspaper or I'm using blank newsprint because I like it better for decorating, but you can also use wrapping paper or even a garbage bag, which makes for a bit more durable waterproof kite. Then cut around it so that you have an edge slightly larger than the frame of your kite. And on that lip that overhangs the edge, you're going to apply some glue and fold it over the string going all the way around. 
So I'm just doing each side. It's a little bit like a Christmas present. You can cut and fold to adjust to make it a nice tight frame. And there you go. You have the basis for your kite and now you can get to decorating. I'm using some tissue paper because it's nice and light and won't bog your kite down, but you can use markers, you can use crayons. All these little tissue paper pieces remind me of a work of art in our collection by uh, Carl Holte, which maybe I'll feature in a later edition of this series. Um, but yes, just make it whatever you want. And once you're finished, flip it over, tie the string around, and you're ready to fly. If you aren't quite up for an outdoor kite flying adventure, you can still join the fun. Some contact paper coupled with tissue paper and a construction paper frame can make a fun window design. Or if you want to align more closely to Hashimoto, you can use tissue paper and toothpicks and trace the outline of a biscuit cutter or small cup to make tiny round kites to string together. Really, anything can become a kite. If you're looking for a frame, just raid your kitchen cabinet for some noodles or straws. At the risk of offering a bad pun, the sky is the limit. So please enjoy, have fun, be well, and we'll see you again soon. Bye.